Hello, friends. So good to see you all again and be with you uh, virtually. But one day, I trust very soon, we'll be together in person, and I long for that day. Uh, the last time we met in our journey together through the book of, of Ephesians, we were just coming to the end of the third chapter. I can't believe that we've been together in this walk now for nine weeks. And it's been rich, and I pray that you've been blessed through this time. That's my prayer for you. I know I've been blessed uh, going through the scriptures. I know I've mentioned before that one of the blessings of teaching is that it forces me to meditate and to really look deeply into the things of God. And as a result, I'm blessed, even over scripture that I may have seen before and taught on before. It's amazing how God's word is like that. I would encourage you if you're not currently doing it, to be in God's word. Read ahead if you want to. Read the scripture we're going to cover and reread after we've gone through it and just see what God, the Holy Spirit, would show you after having listened to it. So today, we're gonna conclude the third chapter in the book of Ephesians, and it's a critical point, juncture, if you will, in our study, in that beginning in the fourth chapter, We move from things being talking about our position in Christ to now our practice on earth. Practical application for the Christian in his daily, his or her daily walk and how we're to conduct our lives. But join me, if you will, going back, um, you recall we talked, we ended last time talking about power. The Apostle Paul was praying and he prayed that God might strengthen us with power through his spirit in your inner being. That is verse 16. So that, number one, Christ may dwell in our hearts. We may know, we may have the power to understand that Christ is in us, the believer. And as a result, he continued on and said, being rooted, this is in verse 17, being rooted and established in love, you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp, remember, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ for you and for me. And the reason Paul prayed for this, because that knowledge is beyond human comprehension. How do I know that? He he says it. Continue on in verse 19. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. This love that God gives those in his family is so deep that we need the Holy Spirit's help just to understand a little bit of the depth of the love that which you and I are loved in the body. We are God's and nobody can take us away. We are now, remember, adopted into this family through Jesus Christ. Imagine the awesome privilege we have of being called children of the living God. No longer in this world apart from God, but now in the very family we can call God our Father. And Paul asked for that, that we would have the power to understand that. And then he burst forth into a, into a prayer of praise. And we, term, we commonly call this, you may have heard the term before, a doxology. This is a prayer of praise to God. He says, follow with me in, chapter, in verse 20 of chapter 3, the final uh, two verses. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power. Remember, we talked about that, according to his power. Not just out of his power, but according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. And I say amen to that too. Because when I read that, I could not be more encouraged in my heart. And I need that encouragement daily. When you read the news, when you look about what's going on, maybe within the organization you work for, some of the policies policies 
that they're putting into place that are counter to what you know to be truth. And you look at this and you say, Lord, how will I ever amount to anything for you? How can I at my age or at my level of education or at my physical ability or inability, how will I ever do anything of lasting value for you? And he says, it is him who, Jesus Christ, who is able to do immeasurably more than you and I can not only ask, you can ask a lot of things and God will still exceed that and is able to exceed even that. But he even goes further and says, or imagine, you and my mind cannot conceive of that which God has stored up for us. The power, the ability. You know, I will go so far as to say this Christian life that we read about, that you and I are called to live, is not just difficult, it is flat out impossible apart from the power of the living God in our lives. The Holy Spirit's presence in our lives gives us the ability to do what he has called us there for, to do. It is only in that power that we're able to conduct our lives. You cannot live according to the Ten Commandments. There are people that may say, well, if I just lived and kept all the Ten Commandments, then I would, be, I would find favor with God. And I would say, no, you would not. It is still only through the blood of Jesus Christ, but it doesn't even matter because you, my friend, and I are incapable of conducting our lives according to that. We can. That's the purpose of the law. The law shows us that we cannot achieve it. We are not perfect. There was only one perfect person who ever walked this earth. That was Jesus Christ. You and I don't, we don't match, we don't meet that criteria of perfection. And you know that, and I know that. That's why we need a savior. And he promises to never leave us and to fill us furthermore with power to live this life. If you think about the totality of scripture, think about the figures who lived lives just like you and I did in the decades since this book was written, the, the Bible. And you think about what God called them to do. They were not capable. God never uses somebody according to their abilities. Matter of fact, he, when, I think it was Spurgeon who says, who said that when God wants to do an, an impossible task, he finds an impossible individual and then crushes them. Meaning it's only in their inability that God chooses them so that when whatever God has willed is accomplished, that individual cannot say it is because of my ability, my strength, my wit, my education, my whatever, whatever it may be. It is solely by the grace of God that this was accomplished. Think of Moses. When God called Moses, and most everybody, if you've ever been near a church in your lifetime, is, knows who Moses is. But God, when he first called Moses, Moses knew that he was not an Egyptian. And at first, in his ability, he, Moses was a very educated man, had all the best education in the land, had all the privileges of being in the household of Pharaoh. You recall, Pharaoh's daughter raised Moses after his mother had put him in the river to protect him during the persecution. And Pharaoh's daughter found him, and he was raised, as the Bible tells us, in the household of Pharaoh. But Moses, when it came time, he felt to lead the people out. He did it in his way, in his ability. And you recall, Scripture tells us that he slew the Egyptian, an Egyptian. And at that, he had to run. It was not under God's timing, and it was not with God's ability. And he then left and said, he had to hide for his life on the backside of a desert. And he did so for 40 years of his life. 40 years. That put him at roughly 80 years of age. It was then and only then that God called him. You recall the burning bush. It was a bush that was on fire, yet it was not consumed. And God called Moses and said, now you're ready. I, I had to wait 40 years for you to come to the end of yourself. And now you're completely incapable. You're an older man now. You've probably written it off years ago that I would ever be able to do something. Now watch what I will do, and the rest is history. We, knew, we know how Moses led the people of, of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt. It is that power that you and I have in our lives. 
God does not change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Bible tells us. That same power exists if we will but not trust the Lord and follow in his ways. Now we come to our transition to chapter four. Moving from our position in Christ to our practice on earth, our earthly conduct for the church, Paul begins in from chapter four through the end of the book, which is chapter six, we will be talking about practical implications of being in the body of Christ. Our new walk, if you will. First, we'll talk about our new unity. We'll spend our time today talking about that. There should be unity in our commitment to Christ. We will be encouraged to use our spiritual gifts. Then we'll move on to our new walk. You recall at first we talk about our position standing, the doctrines of the faith, our stance. We are to stand in those truths. Now we're we're being called to live a life worthy of of, the, of our calling. We're to walk worthy. So we're going from standing to now walking. And by the time we conclude this book, in just a few short weeks, we'll be talking about our battle. We'll be ready to fight the enemy at, on the spiritual realms. But first, we have to learn to walk. So these are our exhortations for earthly living as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And that's really what we are. It's an incredible thing. It, it blows my mind to think that now God has not chosen. Of all the things God have, could have chosen to, to get his, this gospel, this truth out to the world, he, cho- he chooses you and he chooses me. And there is no plan B. That's it. He uses his children in the body of Christ, the church, to take this good news that God loves them and has paid the penalty for sin. And they too can be in this in the body now, in the family of God. But he uses us. We are his ambassadors. What I love about Scripture, too, what stands out to me as we get into this, is the practicality of Scripture. You know, the Bible never doesn't waste its time philosophizing, talking about foolish philosophical arguments. Man likes to do that. Debate, talk about things, never really get anywhere, never improve anybody's uh, life, doesn't really help. He doesn't spend time dwelling on pious platitudes. God's word shows us how to live right now. This word that we're talking about right now is applicable today. It is as up to date as today's headlines. It will tell you what is coming tomorrow. It will tell you what you can expect in the future. Second Timothy, the third chapter, verse 16, tells us that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Jesus told us in John, the 10th chapter, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, steal, kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Why do we have God's scripture? Well, among many reasons, is to equip the believer, equip the child of God, and to, and to show us how to have and live abundantly. Heaven is coming, that's our home. We are strangers walking through this land for a very brief time. We call it a lifetime, but it's very short. Very short. Even if we live to 100 years old, in our minds, that's remarkable. But in the span of eternity, it's nothing. It's not even a rounding error. But right now, God says, you can live abundantly until that time comes, the day of the Lord, when the church will be called up and the bride of Christ as the bride of Christ. And we'll join our Savior at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It'll be a wonderful day. The church will be taken up. But until that time, we can have abundant life right now. And Scripture tells us how to do that. And it tells us, follow with me, if you will, starting in verse 1 of chapter 4 of Ephesians. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 
Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, of all, rather, who is over all and through all and in all. You know, the Apostle Paul starts off by saying, he comes in and he says, a prisoner for the Lord, a prisoner for the Lord. He, you notice he doesn't say, well, you know, I'm here because I was, I was really, it's all based on trumped up charges that the Jews in Jerusalem had, put, had, had accused me for, accused me on, and it's the Romans who imprisoned me and have me here and I'm waiting to see Caesar. No, Paul doesn't say that, does he? Who does he say he's a prisoner of? as a prisoner for the Lord. You see, Paul, recall, this is the prison epistle. Paul had completely embraced the fact that God has him right now in this very position, house arrest, for this very purpose. Because the child of God, God is doing, remember what we just talked about? Immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. How can, how can God use prison for something good? Even when you've been falsely accused. But what the enemy means for evil, God meant for good. And he did that with Paul. And Paul says, I'm here because the Lord has allowed this, and I'm urging you. Imagine that. The man in prison or in house arrest is encouraging the church. He's encouraging the church to live a life worthy of the calling. We're to pursue, you and I as, the members, as members of the body of Christ are, are to pursue unity with diligence. You recall it does not say Uniformity, and I want to I want to expand on that in just a moment. But unity is something we pursue. Unity does not just happen. I work with people all day long on teams and districts and regions, and you probably work. We all work with people, right? Whether it's your vocation, whether it's your hobbies, whatever it may be, even well, the church is made up of a vast array of people. But we come together, all different backgrounds. We've all been raised different ways. We've all been told priorities in our lives are, are, are such and such, and, and it's different from your, yours is different than mine. So we all have our list, right? We have a list of what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Friend, let me encourage you to keep your list. You keep it, we'll have a, since it's just the two of us talking here, let's make a deal. You keep your list and put it in your pocket, and I'll take my list, and I'll keep it in my pocket, and you don't show me yours, and I won't show you mine. All right? Let's commit instead to be, uni to be unified. Let's have unity through the bond of peace. That's how a church is built up. Matter of fact, it's not a suggestion. It's a command for the follower of Christ to seek unity, to keep, make every effort, Paul says, to keep the unity. How? By being, starting off, he says, by being humble and gentle. You know, there are no perfect people. If you're, if you're having a hard time finding a church, perhaps you're watching online because you don't have a church, or the church you were at upsets you in some way, let me just encourage you. Let me just put your heart at rest, at ease. There are no perfect churches. You know how I know? Because I'm part of them. I've been to them, and I go there, and you go there. And as long as people are there, they're not gonna be perfect. There are no perfect people. There are redeemed people, though. And that's why Paul says, be humble and gentle with one another. You're going to be at odds with somebody. You know, somebody's going to say something that's going to offend you. Guarantee it. Just give it. If it hasn't happened yet, mark my words, it will happen. Don't let that keep you from being part of the family. Your own earthly family. I'm sure that a sibling or a parent has said something that has upset you at some point in time. That doesn't keep you from being part of the family. It's expected. The, the body, the family of God in the church is the same way. We'll always be in a state of development. With patience and love, just be gracious towards others. Just don't look, don't focus on those ways. If somebody has upset you, don't let that be the one thing that you focus on. Instead, try to forget that. Be quick to forgive. And instead, focus on those things that you you can appreciate in those people. Pray for your brothers and sisters that offend you. 
that God would give you a heart to love them, to be peaceable with them. And even this one, I think what I see in our day and time more than any other, seek peace and when at all possible, give up your right to be right all the time. I can't help when I watch the news, I see crowds and mobs marching and protesting and they're angry and they're, they're, they're wanting to see uh, one individual group wants, is insisting that the other person or the other group uh, not only see their way of thinking, but actually accept their worldview. And if they don't, they're going to keep marching and throwing things, and, and sometimes it breaks out into downright violence. And I look at that, and my heart grieves, and think, I think to myself, when has shouting and being angry at anyone ever brought them around to your way of thinking? Instead, we should be looking at, our, at their hearts and seeing them as Christ sees them. The world doesn't have that power. Recall, friend, you and I are the ones that have that power. We have that power to make a difference. We can change our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. The world can't do that. They're bound by chains that they cannot break. Well, our time is gone for this session, but we'll pick up right here next time when we're, there, when we're together again in the book of Ephesians. So until then, may God richly bless you. <laughs>